Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Good evening, and thank you, everybody, for joining an important and powerful conversation. Um, we want to thank our sponsors tonight. On behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative's 38th anniversary, we're excited to bring a very special presentation to you brought by Bumble and also by Silence the Shame. So listen, we all know that as Black women, we are in an epidemic within another uh, pandemic. The fact is that as we deal with COVID-19 and all of the daily stressors that impact our lives as Black women, we're overwhelmed. We are dealing with loss of health. We are dealing with the loss of loved ones, the dealing of loss of jobs, loss of income, loss of health insurance. Certainly the list goes on. So the question is, what do we do and what can we do to protect our peace. Ladies and gentlemen, join me tonight. My name is Ebony K. Williams, and we're going to have a dynamic slate of experts and guests that are going to help us answer that very question. So again, my name is Ebony. I am currently the host and executive producer of Revolt Black News on Revolt TV. I also co-host State of the Culture on Revolt TV, and I also contribute to Forbes magazine. I am the author of Pretty Powerful, Appearance, Substance, and Success, and I am a trial attorney by trade. Uh, so certainly I do know exactly what it is to be a Black woman in this moment and deal with all of the things that come along with that. So allow me to first introduce an incredible slate, again, of Black women who know about this work. Join me in welcoming Linda Goler Blount. Linda is the president and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative. She oversees the strategic direction for the imperative. Linda is also responsible for moving the organization forward in its mission to achieve health equity, as well as reproductive justice for Black women. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Um, also welcoming uh, to our evening's conversation, Ms. Carrie Hilson. Carrie, of course, we all know the amazing Carrie Hilson, a songwriter, a record producer. She's an actress and a philanthropist. And she has dedicated so much time and energy in contributing to the well-being and health of Black women and girls. Thank you, Carrie Hilson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also thank joining you. us is Shanti Das. Shanti is the former, she's a former music executive, rather, and the founder of Silence the Shame. Again, one of our fantastic sponsors here tonight. Silence the Shame is a nonprofit dedicated to changing the stigma around mental health and giving a voice to those that suffer from mental illness. Welcome, Shanti. Thank you, Ebony. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. And one of my personal favorites, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. Dr. Joy, we all know and love her. She is the founder of the highly popular mental health platform called Therapy for Black Girls. Dr. Joy is a leading voice for emotional wellness and well being, again, for Black girls and women. Welcome, Dr. Joy. Thank you so much, Ebony. Fantastic. Okay, so I want to start with Linda, um, again, the founder of this fantastic organization, excuse me, president and CEO, rather, of Black Women's Health Imperative. Um, as the organization celebrates 38 years, I can't imagine a single time where this kind of imperative is more necessary as we deal with COVID-19 and, again, the double pandemic of all the things that surround us and challenge us as Black women in our families, in mm -hmm. our workplaces and everywhere else we turn up. So just can you speak a bit about where do we start as black women when we just feel overwhelmed? Yeah, Ebony, that, that, is, that is the word. Um, I think um, certainly all the women that I talk to use that word. They feel overwhelmed or they'll say it's just too much. You know, you think about COVID-19 and if you go way back, which almost seems like prehistory, we thought black people didn't get COVID-19. Right. 
And then all of a sudden, oh, it's black people who get COVID-19 and you know, the data weren't really bearing it out. And, and the fact is that where we are right now um, at uh, nearly 150,000 lost um, and over 4 million cases, the thing we know is that we don't know what the numbers truly are because they're not really being reported. Um, we know black people get both get the disease, get it more severely and die from it much more at higher rates than, than whites. Um, Chicago, for example, black people are 30% of the population, 72% of the deaths. Wow. And it's not just income in PG County, in Prince George's County in Maryland, very middle, upper middle class black community, black people are 85% of all the COVID-19 deaths. So what we're seeing is, you know, this pandemic that's, you know, out of control, um, a public health response by our administration, which has been abysmal. And, you know, the stress of loss of job or being furloughed, having children at home, homeschooling, trying to figure out what you're going to do with your children in, in August, literally next week, moms and, and fathers are having to make that kind of decision. And considering that under the best circumstances, we're not, we're not looking at a widely available vaccine until end of next year. And, and that's pretty ambitious. That probably won't happen. So, you know, the question is how do women deal with this? And, and black women who typically bear the brunt of, of household responsibilities anyway, are feeling exactly that overwhelmed. We talk to women and they say, you know, I just feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders and I'm supposed to do everything. I'm supposed to solve the problems. And what is really concerning is that black women are feeling guilty for not being able to solve these problems. And in fact, of course, it's not their responsibility to solve these problems, but they're having to deal with, you know, looking at police brutality, hearing, you know, what's happening in the media, and then on top of it, a disease that is out of control right now. That's that's the word. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. So again, you know, when we look at some of the various factors, you just named many of them, COVID-19 and all of the um, tangential uh, elements that come along with that on top of, you know, at least we not mention this moment of national and international racial reckoning, you know, that, that has hit us at this mm -hmm. time. And certainly we need to be having these conversations and doing this work, but my goodness, what a time to be dealing with it all. Linda, can you talk about maybe some patterns or trends that you are seeing that Black women are perhaps availing themselves to when it comes to this, this challenge we have in front of us tonight, protecting our peace and, and our wellness? Yeah, the, there's, you know, this these combined pandemics, frankly, are challenging us at every level. I mean, we're seeing intimate partner violence rates increase. You know, people are at home in a way, they're too many stories of women who were about to move out and then couldn't, so they feel trapped. Psychologists are really concerned about depression and anxiety and the, frankly, PTSD arising not from COVID-19, but from seeing George Floyd brutally murdered. Indeed. This goes back to watching Eric Garner and Michael Brown murdered. I mean, this. People were concerned then um, and seeing how it plays out in our body's response. Um, you know, it's the, the increased rates of, of stress-related diseases. We see it in emergency departments, heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, diabetic, you know, crises. All of these things are connected. And these are the very kinds of underlying conditions that increase our risk for severe disease if we're infected by COVID-19. Right. And it's interesting that there's, I've just been reading about an interesting sort of workplace phenomenon. Um, a lot of black people who, who happen to have jobs and maybe they're in management positions are having their employers come to them saying, well, you know, can you help us through this, this issue? Can you, how do we talk about it? What should we do? What do we think? How, you know, what, what do you want us to do? And they're asking people who are not trained to do this kind of work. They're not diversity and inclusion experts necessarily, but they're black people. And black women in particular, people come to because they feel like it's easier. So now on top of COVID-19 and worrying about your family, 
the, the racial tension and the stress of racism that plays out every day, we're being asked to sort of solve the workplace problem. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's really, really fascinating because I've talked to a number of women and there was an, actually an article I read recently that said white coworkers are sort of treating their black coworkers like children. Like, wow. oh, we, we, need to, we need to take care of you. We need to, you know, well, you tell us what to do right. and, and you'll be fine. And, you know, obviously we're not. And obviously that's not helpful. No, not at all. And I think you make such a brilliant point, Linda. The last thing we need is yet another thing to do on our to-do yeah. list as Black women. Mm -hmm. And how ironic that in this time where we should really be being supported and uplifted, um, the world around us seems to ask even more of us. Right, uh, well, exactly. Yeah, we're, we're going to continue this and mm -hmm. really get into some solutions and answers when we get to the, um, the open-ended and roundtable mm -hmm. discussion later. So thank you, Linda. Yeah. We'll thank you. Right yeah. So I want to ask Shanti and Carrie to join me now, the two women who have done tremendous work in the space of dealing with Black women and girls and their well-being, mental and uh, emotional health. So thank you both for joining. Thank you. So one thing that you two share in common you. is you've had, absolutely, you both have had um, just impeccable track records of professional success. You have both been in the music industry at its highest heights. You both had accolades and awards and everything that looks um, to give the, you know, the impression of a charmed and celebrated life. At the same time, you both have also been very public, vulnerable, and strong in sharing your personal struggles with bouts of depression and emotional challenge. So starting with you, Carrie, can you just tell a little bit about how um, you were able to recognize that maybe you were having a challenge um, with that and some places you were able to go to for help and support? Um, well, it was very easy for me to recognize it. It was a lot harder for others to recognize it. Mm. Um, but if, it was very um, noticeable in my productivity my motivation. Um, there were so many areas of my life where I just, I really wasn't motivated to do a lot. And um, I realized that I needed therapy when I noticed how much I was sleeping and trying to escape life and reality or, or my thoughts or my reality at times. So I, that's when I decided to go to therapy. And um, I, did you have, Harry? I just want to ask because mm -hmm. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. I have had my own um, experience with depression starting actually in college and, you know, mm -hmm. at various points in my life too. Um, you, did you have any shame or embarrassment when you first decided to go seek therapy? Mm, no, the shame or embarrassment, I didn't feel that there. I, I felt, um, and not about, not surrounding that, the shame or embarrassment, I think I felt more publicly and mm. with my family, who certainly also would not have understood, why are you sad? You know, mm. you're the one in this family that has all these things going on and you seem very happy and you, you've you got to follow your dreams and, and pursue them, you know? So I think that um, right. the shame and embarrassment would have come from there. And that's why I hid it from my family and my close friends. Indeed. Shanti, how about yourself? Another woman who's had tremendous success professionally and, you know, from the outside looking in, um, what in the world could be wrong, but you experienced your, your experience. So can you share a little bit about it. Sure. Thanks, Ebony. So my father took his own life when I was seven months old and growing up in African-American culture, we didn't really talk about it. We didn't go to counseling as a family. So right out the gate, you know, it was the shame and embarrassment within our family. And it was for us, but I hid and buried a lot of my feelings. And fast forward to working in the entertainment industry, I didn't talk about it that often. And I first started experiencing my own level of anxiety, probably around 2001 when I'm in New York City and went to the records. And I remember being so stressed out in the workplace. I was dealing with a boss that was very condescending, yelling a lot. And it was just a really tough time for me. And I uttered the words, maybe I should just kill myself. Oh, wow. And it really scared me, Ebony, because the fact that my dad had done it. And I went to counseling for the very first time in my early 30s. And then fast forward, I was at the height of my career at Universal Motown. I was experiencing a lot of stress. I developed some physical illnesses with my spine. 
my mom developed Alzheimer's and I was just going into work and keeping my door locked. I didn't want to be bothered. I was withdrawing from friends and family. So I saw the pattern increasing um, in terms of my emotional health and wellness on a decline. And then I moved back home to Atlanta. My best friend took her own life in 2014 and I blamed myself for that. Mm. So I had all these issues over the last, you know, well, really my entire life, but over the last 15 to 20 years that I never dealt with properly. And I considered taking my own life in 2015. It was a really tough time for me. I had counted up all the pills in my cabinet Mm. and, you know, I was, I didn't want to die, but I was ready for the pain to stop. But by the grace of God, I got the help that I needed. I called the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-TALK. And then I went to see a psychiatrist. And I really silenced my own shame around getting help. And that's how the movement was started. Oh, that's so important. Um, I want to stick with this, this element that you bring to, to the conversation, Cherie, that I think is so important. Particularly in this moment, we've got headlines that are really bringing Black people, Black culture, Black celebrity culture, um, and mental health to the forefront. So we actually had an episode about this on my show, Revolt Black News, last week, and we talked about the fact that we're seeing uh, reports of Tamar Braxton's um, reported suicide attempt. We're seeing Amanda Seals speak publicly about her nervous breakdown that she suffered earlier this year. Um, and of course, we're seeing Kanye West um, play out in real time in what you know he has acknowledged to be his bipolar um, illness. Can you both speak, and I'll start with you, I guess, Carrie, when the star is so bright and you guys um, being the talented and um, public figure that, that you are, how does the public's reaction to that impact your ability to take care of yourself and protect your peace? <clears throat> um, it's a huge uh, piece of it, uh, especially in a day like this. Like when Shanti first Uh, enter the industry, mystery was still there. And people didn't know as much as they know on a daily basis, day to day, relationship to relationship, um, event to event, you know what I mean? And and now anything you do or say, even just going out to dinner, whatever, whatever that is, the most simple things are under a microscope. And when you're under that lens and you're dealing with things, and you're already afraid of, um, you know, making certain mistakes. And, and But when you're not well, when you're not well, that fear just opens up that um, threshold um, and allows your illness to be seen. You know, your, whatever it is you're dealing with, um, the threshold just kind of flies open um, when you're not well. So I, I think that it's, it's much harder now. There, there is no mystery, there is no privacy. Um, for those that have dealt with that back in say the 70s and 80s and even 90s, um, even early 2000s, it was it was this way. You could deal with maybe say an addiction or, or an illness right. um, privately. You could go get help and no one would have seen or known anything. So of course that brings on an extra layer of embarrassment and a, shame um yeah yeah that that i think the average person would not be dealing with and can i just add to that Evan? i just want to add that you know when you're in the, the limelight right as, um, as carrie mentioned social media can be a gift and a curse and i think oftentimes you know people because they're still uneducated around emotional health and wellness uneducated around what mental health is versus mental illness, right. that they are they are unkind at times. And it really angered me to see some of the comments um, around some of the celebrities that you mentioned last week and, and what they were going through. And, you know, that's why I think it's important as, you know, everyday people as well as celebrities to establish boundaries in your life, right? That's one of the best things that we can do from a coping mechanism um, as it relates to mental health is establish those boundaries. You know, you can stay off social media or you can block people or you can choose not to look at those comments so that you can really get the help that you need and establish a support circle of love. Yes, what helped me a lot was the two year break I took from social media. Deleting those apps allowed the, you know, when you're reading praise and criticism both can be unhealthy um Mm -hmm. so it allowed me to silence that chatter that becomes 
your subconscious. Right. So that was my way of protecting myself from feeling false love or real hate. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I do think it's a great tool. It's a great tool. I love that you both say that because it's tangible. That's something people, everyday people can do. We understand how to delete an app, take yeah. a two, two year, two week, two month hiatus. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, my um, friend and colleague, Charlemagne the God, he does not look at his phone in the morning for the first hour and a half he's awake, right? Just, just making a conscious commitment right? To do your prayer, to do your meditation, to write in your devotional, do all the things to kind of center oneself um, before you open Pandora's box. And like you said, Carrie, in engage in that false criticism and that false praise. That's, that's great. Um, Shanti, I want to ask you about silence the shame, mm -hmm. because although our society and, and the Black culture in particular, We've come a long way when it comes to mental health and mental illness. We know we still can be ignorant and we still have a long way to go. So if there's one thing that you would tell people that, you know, are just watching this and engaging with us tonight, what's just a piece of information that you would take people, have people take away from this to destigmatize that shame? If, so, if someone they know or love or they themselves feel like something, you know, may be going on depression wise or emotionally. Sure. So I think that most one of the most important things, Ebony, is to get educated. Right. Because, again, I think there is a, still a lot of stigma, but just a lot of the unknown that's out there. And I think when you fear something or you're not knowledgeable about something, it makes you afraid and it makes you act, you know, in ways that aren't always so kind. So the one thing that we talk about from an emotional health and wellness perspective is to come from a place of not judging someone. That's the first thing that I think you can do is don't judge that family member, don't judge that friend, don't judge that colleague, because until you've walked in their shoes or know what they're experiencing, you really don't know what's going on. Uh, at Silence to Shame, we've been offering mental health first aid training, which is an eight hour course that teaches you all about um, the different mental illnesses that exist, how to recognize them, how to treat them, how to process through them. Also, we just started offering QPR training, which is suicide prevention training. And September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So I urge you guys to get educated, take these classes, um, because it's so important for you to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms, whether it's in yourself, within your children, or within your colleagues. That's right. And just to follow up quickly on that, you mentioned something powerful when you said that you had your own contemplation of taking your life, which, mm -hmm. ooh, that's that's so. Vulnerable. It was serious too. I know, I know it was. I felt it when you said it, Shanti. Um, but you said I didn't really necessarily want to die. I wanted the pain to stop, mm -hmm. and I think people have got to hear that and hear that clearly. Um, so again, what is something that you would tell ordinary people to know that? Um, if someone in your isolation, I personally think is a is a tell, you know, when you see your loved ones just isolating. I know that's something I did when I was feeling um, just not well and struggling with depression. Like you said, Carrie, I would just lock myself in my room like for like days and mm -hmm. weeks. Almost. weeks. I, I, yes. I, didn't, <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't answering my phone. I was just going MIA and people like, yo, are you good? And, and the answer was no, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So what can we um, do and say to our loved ones when we see that maybe that isolation start? Well, so for me, um, I, live alone. I still have my moments, especially with COVID and the pandemic. Um, but my friends recognize my triggers now um, and different things. And so you, you have to tell your loved ones that when they're not feeling like themselves or if they're withdrawing, if I know we can't really go out, but if they're not participating in family Zoom calls and right. missing work, um, they're just not showing up for normal things that they would show up for. Or if you text them and they're not responding or they respond the next day, those are warning signs and signals that you need to look out for, particularly the folks that are in isolation, like you mentioned, because you know, even though we have these amazing conversations, it's still a lot going on, Ebony and Carrie. And I think, you know, people are feeling the pressure to come out of this pandemic for, you know, starting a new business and doing that or the other. But some folks are just struggling to even wake up in the morning or even to go to sleep at night. Right. So we have to offer people a little bit more grace 
and check on our loved ones. And when they tell you that they're good, ask them, no, really, you sure? Are, are you good? Like I go that extra mile and that extra step, you know, because sometimes we don't want to place our burden of the anxiety and depression of what we may be going through on our friends and family. So we not we may not be truthful about what we're going through. So you need to go that extra mile to really check in on someone. Yeah. And Carrie, I want to, um, before I let you go ask you this question, um, you are known amongst many other things in the industry. Um, you're a phenomenal generational kind of beauty. That's just, I'm going to fangirl out for a minute. But can you speak to how it feels to, quote, look good on the outside, mm -hmm, but perhaps on the inside be feeling a particular way and how you deal with that and how you mm -hmm. express that? <laughs> the irony of my song Pretty Girl Rock was that, that <laughs> it's actually at my lowest when that mm. one of my hit songs was topping the charts. Um, that's the irony. That's that's the song I decided I need to take a break. Um, I had to step away from the industry entirely while that song was still going. It was against the better judgment of my entire team, the whole label. What do you mean you're going to take some time off um, at the height of this album's hit? Um, but that's the irony. Yeah, it, it, there, is, there is a tendency, um, I think is how I can explain it, to hide behind as women and as black women we have a tendency to uh, but mostly just as women really um we like to hide behind things and um, labels and um makeup and um, hair you know whatever all the aesthetics and um we all feel that pressure we all feel that pressure and i think that it's important that we always check in on a real level um, when we look in the mirror, we should not just be looking to see how we look that day. We should also be seeing who we are and how we're truly doing, how we're truly feeling. You know, I, I know, have you ever just walked by a mirror and you're like, that's all you're getting is like, what do I look like? Yep. That's your only question when you look in the mirror. That should not be your only question. You should really check it, look yourself in the eyes and, and you know, give yourself that real check-in, the real check-in beyond what we think a mirror is for it yeah. serves so many purposes do your affirmations um you know but we, we definitely have to get a little deeper than surface if we want to heal ourselves and others amen thank you for being honest about that um i think a lot of us need to hear that um and really need to like you said sit within that truth um on a daily basis so thank you carrie thank you shanti we're going to be back with you both for our larger roundtable discussion soon now joining me is Dr. Joy, um, who does this work on a daily basis. Dr. Joy, thank you so much for joining. So I want to ask you, yeah, Dr. Joy, again, in this double pandemic moment of COVID and this ra racial revolutionary moment that Black women are very, very much on the front lines for, how important is it for Black women to, in the midst of the work we are doing, still protect our peace and take care of ourselves mentally? Mm -hmm. I think it's critical, Ebony. I think it's critical. And I think, you know, because we are often on the front lines, that makes it more important for us to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves, not only so that we can continue to do the work, but so that we are well. You know, like we can't continue to show up in these spaces for ourselves and for our community if we're not actually well. And so it is really important, like, you know, Shanti and Carrie mentioned, to make sure that we are checking in with ourselves, to make sure that we are honest and taking an honest account of how we're actually feeling. Yeah. And we all know that um, us as Black women tend to lean into and embrace our moniker of the strong Black woman. But we know that sometimes that has a cost. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Joy, can you speak a little bit about when you deal with clients, how you create an opportunity for them to give themselves grace and permission um, to need help? Because I know a mm -hmm. lot of Black women struggle with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's even, you know, and you all have talked about it already tonight, like how much time it sometimes takes 
to even make that first call to a therapist, right? So I think a lot of Black women contemplate making that call and maybe knowing something is a little off and not sure where to go or if it's going to be okay. And so I think it starts with even acknowledging that something may be going on with you. Um, and again, being honest with about how you're feeling. I think therapy is a place where it is a safe space for you to practice taking that cape off. You know, so how can I talk to this other person and be vulnerable about some things that I'm really struggling with? But I think as the therapist, it is also my responsibility to let you know that it's okay to take the cape off, right? I think sometimes black women struggle even in therapy with another black woman because there is the perception that you need to have it all together, right? And so I think therapy can really offer you a space where it feels comfortable eventually. I don't think it does, you know, right out the gate, um, but eventually it can give you a space to, to really kind of take that cape off and to really be honest with how you're feeling. Yeah, and one thing I've started doing, Dr. Joy, is just you know, I'm more aggressive than most in this, as you you know already from our <laughs> previous conversation. Um, I have started verbally pushing back on other people, in, including my other sister queens, right, as Black women, when they, they label that on me. You know, whatever, mm. you know you're strong. Or we yes. know you're not. I'm like, well, hell, I ain't that strong all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> because I feel like that expectation is so high. And yes. it doesn't allow me to have my moment of need, or as we've been discussing tonight, my do what I need to do to protect my peace. Because again, if I'm always being held accountable for showing up for everybody else, who is showing up for me? And, and mm -hmm. so my question, Dr. Joy, is what other tools do you think we can use as Black women to, um, to further eradicate the pressure and the expectation of being the one to have everything on our shoulders. I know Lyndon mm -hmm. also mentioned um, that now in the workplace, white coworkers, non-black coworkers right. are also asking us to show up as diversity officers. I mean, mm -hmm. something else on our plate to do. So how can we push back yeah. on that? Yeah, so you bring up a really important point, Ebony, in that when there is this perception of strength, people don't feel like they have to ask you how you or how you're doing, right? So if people think that you have it all together, it's really easy for you to fly under the radar because people feel like, oh, she's not struggling, so I can put my energy somewhere else. And so it's kind of like a gift and a curse. Like there are some instances, of course, where we want to be strong and take care of things, but we, we are also human, you know? So strength does not mean that we are, you know, superhuman. It still means that we can have our moments. And so I think something that is really important to practice, especially especially right now, is getting more comfortable actually asking for help. And so I think, you know, that has not been comfortable for a lot of us. You know, a lot of us are the strong friends in our group and the strong person in our family. We but I think it is. Mamas. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> All of it has been mama for us, right? And so it is important for us to get more comfortable actually asking for help. Um, I also think that it is really important for us to get really, really comfortable saying no more. So mm -hmm. to all of these requests to be the diversity person in the office or to take on this extra committee or to be the room mom and all of these things. Like we have to get comfortable saying no more because our resources are really at rock bottom at this point. I think if we're honest with ourselves, you know, a lot of us have kind of been sheltering in place in some form or fashion, probably for about four or five months now. Um, you know, like Linda mentioned earlier, kids are going back to school. And so I think we have to be honest about where our resources are and to say, I just don't have it. I don't have the bandwidth to do that. And for that not to be shamed, right? I would really like to see corporate culture change in terms of the expectations productivity and um, people showing up and doing all of these things right now, because it really feels like it has been lost that we are living in a double pandemic, especially for Black women, right? So all of these ideas about having to show up and be on all these Zoom calls and all of this stuff, like it really is not giving people the level of grace that I think that they really deserve right now. So I'd really like to see a shift there. But until that happens, I think it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we are saying no more. I believe in no, the power of no. Yes, Dr. Joy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you two questions about therapy before we wrap up. So the first question, um, we heard Carrie describe what her catalyst was for going to seek um, therapeutic help, Shanti as well. Um, in both of those cases, and I know for myself, um, when I first started experiencing isolation and depression, um, we often we are led to therapy because of a, some type of crisis, right? Some kind mm -hmm. of emotional crisis, some big thing. Um, is happening or we're feeling one big particular way. 
Um, but can you speak to people that might not be feeling that level, that that heightened um, mm -hmm. sensation of depression or anxiety um, or what have you, but could still benefit from therapy anyway? Yeah, I think that most people can actually benefit from therapy at various points in their lives. I think that that's one of the big misconceptions about therapy is that it is only for a crisis. When the mm -hmm. truth is that you can do some really great work in therapy and maybe even prevent a crisis if you go before then. Um, you know, so there's always work, I think, to be done in terms of recognizing different patterns in your life. Um, there may be work to be done in terms of what your relationships look like with other people. How good are you at setting boundaries and asking for what you need in relationships? Um, this definitely comes up with Black women often um, trying to make ourselves small so that maybe we're not, you know, as noticed or we're not actually going for what we want in our lives. So I think therapy can be for all of those things. There's nothing really too small or too big to talk with a therapist about. Yeah, and a good follow-up with that. I, I often um, get asked when people ask me about my therapeutic experience and my relationship with my therapist, how long have you been going, right? Like, because a mm -hmm. lot of times people start therapy with an expectation of, they want to know when they get to be done, right, Dr. Yes. Schwartz? <laughs> is, is it six weeks? Is it six months? Is it a year? So can you speak a little bit about the variety of duration um, that people mm -hmm. can experience with therapy? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think especially if you are not familiar with therapy, it's kind of like, okay, how long do I have to do this? Right. Um, and, you know, so some people will go with a s certain uh, collection of symptoms, right? So maybe they're really anxious or having trouble sleeping. And so they go to therapy for a while and they maybe see some improvement in those symptoms. And then maybe they decide that they're done. But what honestly happens for a lot of people is that they go for a while, they maybe see some relief in their symptoms, or they, you know, can interact in different situations in a they're way no that's healthier for them. Right. Yes, they're no, they're no in longer in crisis, right? And they really appreciate having that hour just for themselves, you know. As busy Black women, and I know a lot of us are, we yes. don't often take that time to just be quiet and focus on ourselves and really put our needs first. And so what happens with a lot of clients is that they learn to really value that time and will extend therapy way past what initially brought them there. I love it. I think it's fantastic. You know how I feel about it, Dr. Joy. I, yeah. um, I do maintenance therapy, you know, just because mm -hmm. I feel like a, I'm a black woman in America. I'm at any given moment going to need a little bit of support. Right. Um, and then just the work that we do, I think, requires all the support and resources we can get. Um, so with that, I want to invite the rest of our panelists um, to go ahead and join us, Dr. Joy. So that's going to mm -hmm. be Linda, Carrie, Shanti, and um, everybody. Is that everybody? Do we have everybody? Yes. Um, for now, we're going to have a roundtable, ladies. So obviously, we all heard one another in dialogue. Uh, my first question is, does anybody have a question? I've been running my mouth and asking all the questions. Do any of y'all have questions of one another based off of what you've heard tonight? I have questions. Yes, <laughs> Because I feel like even as, as an advocate in the work that I do, or, or even as Black women, we're trying to help each other. I've heard this notion of being the wounded healer, you know? Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that, how we're all going through so much and, and how do we heal others when we're still trying to heal ourselves? Mm -hmm. That is a great question, Shanti. You always have great questions. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I think that, you know, for a lot of people, what brings them to a helping profession is um, maybe some experience of, you know, something difficult in their lives and they're trying to like figure out. And so it, it is sometimes what draws people to the field. But I also think that it's important to think about healing on a continuum, right? Like we're never really done. You know, so there is no graduation, so to speak, or like I'm 100% healed. We know that like difficult things will happen in our lives, right? Like last year, this time, we couldn't have predicted where we are right now. And so different old traumas are being unearthed for people that maybe they thought they had worked through, but now given everything happening, they're having to do more work around that. So I think this idea of the wounded healer really just kind of indicates that we are all in process and I just maybe need to be a little further in my own healing to be able to offer somebody else some assistance. Thank you. Great. That's great. Um, I'm going to open it up to oh, Linda. Do you have a question? Yeah, Please. just because I, I just love that point, Dr. Joy. That is so important. I was thinking, you know, I kind of look at therapy as sort of like your journey to wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you never really get there. You never say I'm done trying to be wise. But could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit to 
women who are in that pursuit, who are, who are searching, um, and also maybe even talk to some of the women who perhaps can't afford to come to a therapist or may not have insurance to pay for, for therapy, but what are some of the things that, that they can do also on this journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I do think that there are tons of resources. Um, so we have a lot on the Therapy for Black Girls website. Um, we have the therapist directory as well as the podcast. And I talk about every week when the podcast comes out, the fact that it is not a substitute for therapy, but I am a therapist and the conversations I have are with other therapists. And so undoubtedly, you'll be able to get some information that may help you in some ways in your life. Um, there are also tons of great books. Um, so we have a, an Amazon list of all of the books that the, the guests from the podcast suggest from everything around emotional eating um, to, you know, dealing with parenting and how do you regulate your emotions so that you can help your kids. Um, so I think that self-help and books, you know, those kinds of resources can also be really helpful. Um, something else that you may want to look into um, is Open Path Collective. So openpathcollective.org is an organization that has a therapist directory and the therapists offer a sliding scale session, so between thirty and fifty dollars. Um, the Loveland Foundation is an organization that raises money for Black women and girls to be able to go to therapy. Um, so if you're wanting to work with a therapist but can't afford it, then they will pay for the sessions. Um, and if you are employed, I think something that people miss very often is their employee assistance program. So lots of us, you know, have EAP programs where your employer will actually pay for a couple of sessions mm -hmm. without you ever having to use your insurance. Okay, thank you. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those resources, Dr. Joy. Phenomenal. You know, I believe in um, therapy for Black girls. I'm an avid listener to your podcast. Great topics, all kinds of range. Um, before I go further with my question, I do want to make sure that our audience that is watching and listening knows that I want you guys to ask questions here too. So please put those in the chat. Uh, we've got people. Uh, feed, feeding those to us so we can get you guys involved as well. Now, I'm going to ask you this, Dr. Joy. I don't like to take my life commandments from social media. However, mm. I saw this meme the other day and it struck a chord. It said this. It was a relationship advisement. It says, I need Black women to stop mistaking shared trauma for compatibility. Mm. Mm. It hit me a little deep. So <laughs> <laughs> if you... If you would speak um, to sometimes how that can be um, confusing for some of us, because I, I, I know exactly what it can feel like in terms of, oh, I struggled with this aspect of my childhood. So did you. We must belong. Mm -hmm. together. Um, yet we know mm -hmm. long term in the relationship, those very um, traumas can work against the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it may be great to find somebody who has a similar kind of concern, right? There are probably things that you might bond over related to that, but you just want to make sure that that is not the basis of the relationship because you are not your trauma. You are not the things that have happened to you. And so it's important for you to do your own work in terms of therapy or whatever healing practice you um, participate in because your trauma is a part of your story, but it is not the entire story. And so if if you're connecting with someone with that as the basis, then that's the, that's as far as the relationship is going to be able to go. And so if you have unhealed trauma and this other person has unhealed trauma, then you're acting out of your traumas as opposed to acting out of a place of healing. Wow. Perfectly worded. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you, Linda. Again, I know that you are doing such incredible work overall with the Black Women's Health Imperative. And this is a week long um, experience for everyone that's participating in this entire wonderful program. Can you speak about how important the mental health we're talking tonight about protecting our peace? Um, but sometimes people can feel like the physical aspects of our health are so much more important than these emotional ones. Um, but can you speak to why you thought it was important to dedicate a prime time panel to this issue of mental health? I can, and, and I'll, I'll say something that, that maybe people might find surprising. Um, a few years ago, we conducted a survey and we asked about 5,000 black women to define health. And it was, we just asked them for words and phrases. What does health mean to you? And Ebony, about 85% of the words and phrases black women used to, used to describe health and define health were psychosocial. I'm calm, I'm at peace, I'm in control. 85, almost 85% 
only about 10% of words that black women use to define health had anything to do with disease or physical health. So we look at health through how we feel, through a psychosocial lens. And so we, a a few years ago, completely changed the approach to our work, which starts with how do you feel, sister? How does it feel to be a black woman at this moment in time? And then we go from there because from what we know from black women is if we're not feeling it, it it shows in our bodies. So Mm -hmm. now we have, and I won't go into all of it, but we've got lots and lots of research that looks at how experiences of racism affects our weight gain, how experiences of racism affect infant and maternal mortality. All of this has been documented. And so we know that we've got to get to that place of peace in order to get to that place of health. They are Mm -hmm. one and the same. Love it. Love it. Wow. Amazing work. Mm -hmm. Incredible work. We're grateful for it. Um, Anybody else have questions for one another um, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, as we talk about protecting our peace? Can I just share something that I coined a new definition for coping um, on your journey to peace. And so the C in coping is for care. You got to have a a really robust daily self-care regimen to find that peace from an emotional health and wellness perspective that you're looking for. The O is for being open, being open to talking to someone about what you're going through. If you're not ready to talk to a therapist, talk to a friend or a trusted colleague or your life coach. P is for professional, getting the professional treatment on prayer in your life, because I use hashtag Jesus in therapy all the time. And the E is for establishing your support circle. You know, that we have friends and sometimes we compartmentalize our relationships, but who's really in that wellness support circle for you? So it's important to establish that. So you have the self-care, you're open to sharing and talking, talking, getting professional help and establishing that support circle. I love a good acronym. Thank you, Ms. Shanti. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, that we got a question here, yep, from our audience. Want to get them involved. And I will start with um, Carrie, if you could answer, and then Linda, if you could share mm-hmm. too. This question is, how do we address the divide that sometimes shows up among us as Black women? We know we don't always operate collectively. How do we fix that, Carrie? Um, I think, uh, honestly, the times have allowed that to occur um, more naturally than ever before in history. Uh, mm-hmm. If we didn't understand or awaken to that um necessity uh, of togetherness before and sisterhood and and all of these things. If we didn't, you know, wake up to that prior, you certainly will now, because that's what I'm seeing all around my, you know, in my world. Um, I'm seeing black women, especially uh, championing each other, supporting each other, helping each other um, in so many ways. So I, I know that, you know, um, we all have dealt with that in some sense, um, especially when it comes to like, the, when you're looking at or coming, when you're in the dating world, um, <laughs> there is a whole <laughs> lot of competition, you know what I mean? There's yes. a whole lot of competition and, and I, I won't get into all the reasons we are kind of um, finding ourselves in that scenario at, at one place or another and other ways we've been conditioned to yep. be this way. Um, the men have the same issue and, and, you know, we, but I think if you, if you weren't there now, if you weren't there before, you're absolutely going to be thinking along those lines now. And and that's one beautiful thing that has actually, that I've seen come of a time like this. I was going to say, that's a great silver lining point, Carrie, mm-hmm. because there's so, so much um, that this moment has cost us, but I yeah. absolutely concur that we have gained a sense of collective power yes. um, because the circumstances have required it. They have required yes. it. Um, absolutely absolutely yeah. well linda i know yeah. we're a little bit wrapping out um of time but i know you've got some great closing remarks before we head out yeah and i i just want to echo what carrie said that is so true so, you know society has has and systemic oppression has worked to try to divide us mm-hmm. but now at this moment of crisis I think we all are recognizing how important it is to come together we we talk about being your sister's keeper you know as shanti said you know if you don't hear from somebody call, check on her. How are you doing? Ask some questions. Don't just take okay for an answer. Probe, mind, like we say, mind your sister's business. 
<laughs> if there's any time to do it, now's the time to get into her business just to make sure she's she's okay. Um, so, you know, I just want to um, thank you, Ebony, and and you. you know, and Carrie and Dr. Joy and Shanti for for sharing your wisdom, but for for the courage, it takes real courage to to come and talk about these issues. You are helping so many black women just by having this conversation. And I want you to know how much I appreciate it because I appreciate our, our media sponsor rolling out and silence the shame, yes. And our presenting sponsor, Bumble. And I, I just wanna mention one thing. If you go to our website, um, uh, there's a stress test and you can go to stresstest.bwhi.org and take the stress test. It's, it's been sponsored by Purely. We've got wonderful partners to get a sense of how you are feeling, what kind of stress you're under, and then look at and download our emotional wellness kit. We've got to take care of ourselves. You know, our organization was founded with when Billy Avery talked to 2000 of her friends and said, we've got to take care of each other, but most importantly, we've got to take care of ourselves. Self-care is that important. So please do whatever you can. I love what Dr. Joy said, no is a complete sentence. I say use it early and often and, and ask for help. Um, stay connected to your sister, please. And thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, perfectly said. And I want to thank Dr. Joy. I want to thank Carrie. I want to thank you, Shanti. And I really want to thank you, Linda, um, because none of us would be here this evening but for the incredible work you are doing. I know you've thanked them, but of course, Bumble, of course, Silence the Shame, rolling out, and everybody that made tonight's discussion on protecting your peace possible. We know it's expensive, but it is so worth it. So with that, continue to enjoy all the rest of the activities this week for hashtag BWHI. Make sure you use that on social media and good night. Good night. <laughs>